Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Box and Reviews and How To, and on today's video we're taking a look at a slightly older motherboard, but one which certainly deserves your attention here in 2021. This is the MSI B450M Mortar Max. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so in today's video we're taking a look at MSI's B450M Mortar Max. Now the B450 chipset is in the kind of mid-range for the AMD M4 socket and has really been replaced pretty much now across the board with the B550. Although some of you may still have a need or requirement for a either a cheaper board or something with a little bit more compatibility. Certainly compatibility with B550 and A520 motherboards, especially if you're planning on using some of those second generation processors such as the 3400G, 3200G, etc, etc. Fortunately, this max version of the board has an expanded BIOS, which is doubled in size, so now it can incorporate a load more processors. So this will work with pretty much all processors on the AM4 socket, from pretty much the Ryzen 3 1200, right away up to the heady heights of the Ryzen 5950. I probably wouldn't recommend pairing it with this, but certainly it is listed in the spec and it will work. So if you're looking for an ultra cheap board to get maybe your 5600X up and running, this is definitely worth a look. At the moment in the UK, this retails for somewhere in and around the £50 mark, which I think for a budget-minded board is a fantastic option. Hence the reason why I've bought one, but there certainly are reasons why you possibly wouldn't want to buy one. And we'll go through that as we go through this review and unboxing. So let's start off with a tour around the box and we'll go through the packaging, see what we actually get inside. We'll go through the motherboard, all the different ports and connectivity, and we'll discuss some of the potential pitfalls that you may find with this particular board and also some of the benefits. So first of all, let's take a look at the box itself. So as you can see, this is the MSI B450M Mortar Max. Essentially, this is a kind of, for want of a better term, it's a cut down Tomahawk. So if you had your eyes on the B450 Tomahawk, this is pretty much its micro ATX twin. As you can see on the box, it says we've got support for Ryzen 3000 series processors. Now, depending where you get your motherboard from, potentially you may find one of these which actually has the newer BIOS on, which will support 5000 series straight out of the box. On the side of the box, it does go into some detail about processors that it does not support. So that is primarily the Athlon A series and the Athlon X4 range of AM4 processors, which were around probably about two years ago. It does, however, support first, second and third generation Ryzen processors and Ryzen processors with integrated Radeon graphics and also ones with Vega graphics. So something like the 3000G, again, 3200G, 2400G, all those kinds of things are gonna be absolutely perfect in a micro ATX build with this board. Looking at the back of the box, so we've got some of the highlights here. So we've got the extended heatsink design, which is actually one of the primary reasons why this board actually does so well. The VRM is an excellent VRM. It's a four plus two phase setup and you've got a really nice heat sink on there which keeps the VRMs under control. They won't be frosty cold, but they're certainly do a little bit better than some of their other B450 micro ATX counterparts. We've also got AMD Turbo USB, so we've got USB 3.2 Gen 2 support. We've got steel armor, which is uh, the bracing around the graphics card slot there. Also, we've got support for Mystic Light. Unfortunately, Mystic Light is a little bit misleading. Mystic Light support doesn't necessarily mean addressable RGB support. And on this particular board, there is no addressable RGB support. So that is one thing which is gonna be potentially a big put off for some people. This is purely the static 12 volt RGB setup. So yes, you can have color fades, that kind of thing, but no addressable RGB or kind of chase patterns. Also, we've got audio boost. So we've got a separated track for the audio and also is isolated and all that kind of stuff. It does say high quality audio capacitors, but unfortunately that is one thing which this board has always suffered with slightly. The audio quality, although certainly is passable, if you're expecting a high definition output, then yeah, you are gonna have to spend a little bit of money. This does rely on the ALC892 chipset, which is absolutely fine, but there are some issues with people experiencing a little bit more static noise than you would otherwise find. One really nice feature on this board is we've got the BIOS flashback button. So if you do buy a 5000 series processor and you get one of these and it doesn't have the latest BIOS on it, it's really easy to just get the USB stick, download the BIOS and flash the BIOS without the CPU installed. Absolutely brilliant. And also there was videos that we've done on that many, many times. If you wanna check out that and click on the link up here. We've got turbo M.2 slots. So this board has two M.2 slots for expandability with M.2 drives, both PCIe NVMe and also M.2 SATA. 
There is the Easy Debug LED, again, one of those things from MSI which I absolutely love. I don't necessarily need a digital readout to tell me what is going on as long as it, I've got some kind of means of working out where my potential issue is. So this has got four LEDs which light up, so you've got CPU, VGA, RAM, and your boot. So depending on which one's lit up, you know where to start looking should there be any problems with the system posting. Last of all, we've got DDR4 Boost. So this will support, depending on your processor, DDR speeds of up to 4133 megahertz, which again, for pretty much most systems is gonna be absolutely fine. You will find with certain processors, you are gonna be limited down to possibly 3200 or 3433, or in some cases down to 2666. So that's enough waffle, let's take a look at the board and see what we actually get inside the box. So first of all, obviously you get the motherboard itself. We get a separate IO shield, a thank you for choosing MSI product, a driver DVD, MSI quick install guide, MSI B450 M Mortar Max user manual, a pair of SATA cables, an MSI gaming badge, and a leaflet with other MSI products. There are also two M.2 drive screws, which I've actually mounted on the board to save me losing them. So let's take a tour of the board and look at the connectivity. Now actually, first of all, before we do that, the, uh, the pure looks of this board I really like is pretty neutral. So we've got kind of black, gray, silver, bit of chrome, very neutral, should fit in with most builds. Also, you can see one of the highlights really is this huge heat sink, which is over the VRM, which keeps things again under control, not totally frosty, but you should find with most systems, you'd be looking around about the sort of 50 to 70 degrees mark for the VRMs under thermal loads. So that's certainly within the spec of most processors. Some of you with eagle eyes out there may have actually noticed a very strong similarity between the actual look and the kind of layout of this board and the Tomahawk board. And that is pretty much by design. Again, this is essentially its micro ATX brother. So let's start with the connectivity. So in the top corner, we've got an eight pin EPS connector for your CPU additional power. Moving across, we've got a CPU fan header. Sadly, there is only one CPU fan header on this one, so if you are using a CPU cooler with dual fans, then you will need a splitter of some sort. And also, if you're using a AIO and you're looking for a pump header, that is another thing which is sadly missing on this particular board. Of course, if you want to, you can buy splitters, etc., or hubs, which will take some of the strain off the board, but I thought I'd point it out anyway. Underneath that, we've got our AM4 socket, and as we said, we've got really great support for pretty much every processor that AMD has made on the AM4 platform of course, apart from those A-series and the Athlon X4s. Moving across, we've got four RAM slots there, so this supports up to 128 gigabytes of RAM. I guess most people who are spending this little amount on a motherboard probably won't be populating it with that much RAM, but hey, you never know, and potentially it is possible should there be a drastic decrease in RAM prices. Moving further over, we've got a system fan header there, so that is a four-pin PWM. All of the fan headers can be controlled within the MSI center or can be done really easily in the BIOS. We do have a BIOS walkthrough video on this, so if you want to take a closer look at the MSI BIOS on this particular board, then click on the link up here. Moving underneath that, we've got our diagnostic D-LED. Again, really great for diagnosing problems if anything's going on when it's booting up. We've got four lights on there, like I said before, so you've got CPU, VGA, RAM, and boot. So yeah, it gives you a really good idea should there be any unforeseen issues. Underneath that, we've got our 24 pin power connector with all solid pins. And moving down even further, we've got four SATA connectors, two of which are pointed in towards the case and two which are pointing out. These are great because you can use all four and still use your PCI Express stuff without losing any of the SATA ports. Quite often on the B450 chipset and even the B550 chipset for that matter, if you start plugging in things to PCI Express, you generally tend to lose SATA ports. Normally that is on boards that have kind of like six ports. Something with four should be absolutely fine. Moving across, we've got our M.2 slot at the top here. So this is actually shared from the CPU itself, not part of the chipset. So this is gonna support PCI Express Gen 3 up to times four speeds. You may find some differences depending on your processor, etc. but that is pretty much the fastest it'll go. Likewise, the actual slot underneath here is PCI Express Gen 3 times 16. Sadly not Gen 4, but that is a limitation of the chipset itself. But even with that said, if you were to put a 3080 graphics card in here, it's very unlikely you'd notice any difference unless you're really looking at benchmarks and the finer details. In normal use, you wouldn't know the difference at all. Moving back to this side, so we've got the heatsink over the chipset there, and we've got our front IO connections down the bottom here. So we've got our main front panel IO connection there. We've also got a RGB connection, again, not addressable, just purely 12 volt RGB. And next to that, you've got a speaker connection. So if you want to put a BIOS speaker in, you certainly can do. Next to that, we've got a header for our USB 3.2. This is for Gen 1 ports, which should go to the front on your PC case. 
Next up, we've got a pair of USB 2.0 headers for connecting things like IQ or additional USB ports somewhere in the system. Moving along slightly more, we've got a, a slight oddity. So we've got a LPT port, should you still wish to use a parallel printer port. And next to that, one of which might be very important to some of you, and that is the TPM support. So you can actually plug in a TPM module on this should you want to, which is gonna be pretty much very relevant when Windows 11 comes along, or potentially. Just above there is the JC1, which is the reset button for your CMOS. The battery for the CMOS is up here, but the reset button is tucked away over here. Moving along, we've got a COM port. And next to that, we've got another RGB header. Again, only 12 volts, sadly. Followed up by a system fan header. And then finally, we've got our HD audio connector. Moving up slightly, we've got obviously a PCI Express Gen 2 times 16 slot. Although this slot is only wired for eight times. If you're using the M.2 drive in this particular slot here, then you lose this slot. So you can't put three M.2 drives in here, sadly, with an adapter card because it would need to use this and that. So yeah, that is one or the other on those two there. Moving up, we've got PCI Express Gen 2 times one ports. These will be fine for things like Wi-Fi cards, that sort of thing. But do also bear in mind that because they are shared also, if you use one, you can't use the other. Moving up slightly above the graphics card slot there, we've got another fan header. So the fan headers are a little bit limited on this. You've only got three plus the main CPU header, but obviously if you want to, you can use splitters or hubs, which are very cost effective ways of adding more fans to your system. So let's take a look at the IO on the rear of the board. So pretty decent IO actually on this, plenty of USB ports, and also some really nice options for display outputs. So on the very end there, we've got our BIOS flashback button. That can also be used for a BIOS reset as well. So again, if you wanna see how that works, there's a link on the video description up here. We've got a keyboard port, so keyboard and mouse, PS2. Underneath that, we've got a pair of USB 2.0 ports. Next to that, we've got a DisplayPort 1.4 and an HDMI 2.0B, so both of which 4K 60 hertz, no problems at all, which is gonna be great, especially with some of these newer APU chips coming out from AMD in the future. Moving along slightly, we've got four USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, and we've got our Realtek 8188H gigabit LAN on top of that with some activity LEDs. Moving across even more, we've got USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, so that is your 10 gigabit per second ports, type A and type C. Moving along slightly more, we've got our audio output, so pretty decent output on this. We've also got an optical speed if. My big thing about this is I don't like the color coding. I know it's a very, very minor thing. The red port there is the one that you'd plug into your headphones or your speakers. Uh, you can see a full layout of that actually in the manual, so it's not too bad. I would much prefer those to be the traditional color code, so kind of like pink for your mic, green for your headphones, blue for line in, etc., etc. I think that's a pretty minor quibble. One other possible minor quibble, again, I suppose it's probably quite telling of when this board was actually released. This doesn't have any wireless connectivity on it whatsoever, so we don't have Bluetooth and we don't have Wi-Fi. That is, of course, optional, and there are other models within the range which do add on those features, but you are going to be paying considerably more. Realistically, I would suggest if you are looking for a Wi-Fi card or Bluetooth card, you can get a PCI Express one very easily, which we've got links to up there, and it also shows you how to install them. Or alternatively, just get a USB dongle. There's plenty of USB ports on there, so most people I think should be fine. But just be aware, this does not have any wireless connectivity. So we've come to the end of the, uh, the introduction of the board, and it's time to talk about who this board is actually for here in 2021, or obviously 2022, depending on when you're watching this. At the moment, this board ticks a lot of boxes for budget builders. Now, if you're trying to get hold of a processor, something like the 3400G, which I have got one of those, this is gonna make a really, really good platform for budget builders. Put on a 3400G or 3200G, 2400G, even a Ryzen 3000G, it's gonna get you up and running and it's gonna be relatively enjoyable. You will be able to overclock the processor and also the onboard GPU with pretty much no problems whatsoever. Due to the VRM, the power management of this board, etc., etc., yeah, it's gonna be a great experience and it's gonna do much better than it would with something like an A520, which you may find issues with with compatibility. Also, if you wanted to then upgrade this, then pretty much it's an open market. You can go for pretty much anything you want to. It does support up to the 5950X and possibly further on beyond that. Realistically, I think most people, if you're gonna pair this with something, something like the 2700X, 3600X, 
or maybe even a 5600X, that is where this board is gonna really excel. And due to the, the slightly limited VRM, although still a very capable one, I think if you go and hire maybe eight cores, 16 cores, 12 cores, then you may start running into some issues, especially if you have a thermally challenged system. If you don't have a lot of airflow, then you're gonna start seeing problems. But I think for most people, if you're trying to put together a very modest micro ATX system and you're not particularly bothered about addressable RGB, I think this does tick a lot of boxes. Hence is why I bought one. So we will be doing a build in this coming up soon with our 3400G, finally gonna actually get some use out of it with this board. So if you wanna see how that goes, don't forget to click on the subscribe button and the chime icon and you'll be notified of future video releases. But I think that's gonna pretty much wrap this one up. It is an older board now, but I think now with the massive price drops, essentially this is half price from what it was when it came out, around about 110 when it came out. Now you can pick them up for somewhere in the round of the 40 to 50 pounds mark. I think for a budget system, these do really need a second glance. So let me know what you think about this one in the comments section below. But in the meantime, I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To. And hopefully we'll catch you in the build video. Thanks for watching.